Diabetes is one of the most common conditions worldwide, and in this video we're going to go through the different drugs used to treat diabetes. We're going to cover many drug classes, including which diabetic patients need which medication, how they work, and the potential side effects. So, first of all, we know that diabetes is characterized by a relative lack of insulin, the hormone that is produced in the beta islet cells of the pancreas, and this causes glucose to be uptaken from the blood into the tissues, amongst other things. Type 1 diabetics are unable to produce this hormone, while type 2 diabetics can produce it, but can produce enough of it to achieve the desired glucose lowering effect due to their insulin resistance being too high. This means that different therapies can be used for these two forms of diabetes. Let's start with insulin itself, which is given to all patients with type 1 diabetes. There are several types of insulin given, including rapid-acting, short-duration insulin, intermediate insulin, and long-acting insulin. Rapid-action, short-duration insulin is used to control the postprandial glucose spikes. It takes around 15 minutes to reach its onset, and 45 to 75 minutes to reach its peak. Aspart, Lispro, and Glulacine are examples of rapid action, short duration insulin. Intermediate insulin includes regular insulin and neutral protamine hagadron insulin, also known as NPH insulin. Now, regular insulin has an onset of around 30 minutes and peaks between 1 and 2 hours. It's often used as a therapy for diabetic ketoacidosis and for hyperkalemia. Finally, the long-acting insulin. Examples include Detimir and Glargine. Glargine actually has no peak and has a 24-hour duration, while Detimir lasts between 18 and 23 hours. Long-acting insulin is used because we need to keep the blood sugar stable in periods between meals as well as close to mealtime. The main side effect of insulin therapy itself is hypoglycemia which can lead to tachycardia and palpitations, as well as sweating, nausea, and convulsions. To reverse it, you would give glucose or glucagon. The remaining drugs on our list usually need some form of endogenous release of insulin, and therefore these are mostly used in type 2 diabetics. To make things easier to remember, we can split these drugs into drugs that either act on lowering glucose or drugs that act on stimulating insulin. We look at the drugs that stimulate insulin first, and these are the sulfonylureas, meglitinides, GLP-1 agonists, and the glyptins. Sulfonylureas are drugs that, in a nutshell, increase the amount of endogenous insulin released by the pancreas. They work by binding the ATP-dependent potassium channel on the beta cells, which then leads to the potassium channels closing, and so less potassium is able to escape the cell. Therefore, the membrane begins to depolarize, leading to the opening of the voltage-gated calcium channels, which then allows calcium to flow in and causes the release of insulin. There are first and second generation sulfonylureas, but the first generation are barely ever used now, so I'll focus on the second generation. These include gliburide and glimepiride, both of which have a long duration. Glipizide is another, but this one has a shorter duration and therefore has a lower chance of causing hypoglycemia. That brings us to the side effects, which include obviously hypoglycemia, but also hunger and weight gain. Next, we have the meglitinides, which work like the sulfonylureal drugs, but these are non-sulfur drugs, and so these can be alternatives for when patients have sulfur allergies. Examples include repoglinide, nataglinide. Side effects, just like the sulfonylureals, also include hypoglycemia especially when the patient drinks alcohol, as well as weight gain. GLP-1 agonists are next on the list, and this stands for glucagon-like peptide 1 agonists. GLP-1 is a peptide normally secreted by intestinal L cells in response to food intake, and so what these drugs do is bind to GLP receptors and activate their effects. The effects are an increase in insulin release with decreased glucagon release as well as a delay in gastric emptying, and an increase in satiety. Glyptins are the final class of drugs in this category, and they prevent the breakdown of endogenous GLP. Glyptins are dipeptidyl peptidase 4 inhibitors, 
known as DPP4 inhibitors. And DPP4 is an enzyme that breaks down GLP. So by inhibiting the breakdown of GLP, the result is more GLP available binding to its receptors and exerting the effects. The important thing to note here is that they have a glucose dependent effect, meaning that they work better at higher glucose levels and work less at lower glucose levels. Therefore, they are not likely to give hypoglycemia. Examples of these drugs include cytogliptin, saxagliptin, and linagliptin. The side effects include upper respiratory tract infections and pancreatitis. Okay, so let's move on to the drugs that work by lowering glucose levels. The most famous in this group is metformin. In fact, it's the first line oral agent for type 2 diabetics. Metformin has several effects. It decreases glucose production from the liver, it decreases glucose absorption from the gut, and increases the amount of glucose being taken out of the blood in the periphery. It prevents hepatic production of glucose by inhibiting glycophosphatase dehydrogenase and by activating AMP activated protein kinase. Side effects include lactic acidosis, because lactic acid can no longer enter the gluconeogenesis pathway and be broken down. Therefore, it builds up, giving the acidosis. This is especially true in renal failure, as metformin is excreted renally. Metformin can also cause anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, but it does not cause hypoglycemia. The next one's a bit of a mouthful, the thiazolidine dions. These drugs lead to less glucose being produced in the liver, the muscle, and the fat, but they also cause an increase in glucose utilization. They do this by binding to the peroxisome proliferator activated receptor gamma, another mouthful, which is an intranuclear receptor. When they bind to PPAR gamma, there is an upregulation of adiponectin, leading to an increased insulin sensitivity, an increase in fatty acid oxidation, which therefore leads to an increase in the triglyceride storage. Remember though, that because these drugs work through gene regulation, they take some time to work. Examples include rosiglitazone and pioglitazone. The side effects of the thiazolidine dions are weight gain, fluid retention, and edema due to an increase in sodium reabsorption. They can also lead to a predisposition to fractures due to a decreased bone mineral density. Amylin analogues are next. They delay gastric emptying, they decrease glucagon levels, and they decrease appetite. Side effects include hypoglycemia, nausea, vomiting, and anorexia. These drugs can also be used to control the postprandial glucose spike. The main example is pramlinidine. Alpha-glucosidase inhibitors are our second to last class. These drugs inhibit alpha-glucosidase, and this enzyme is responsible for breaking disaccharides into monosaccharides in the gut. Therefore, if we inhibit this enzyme, then sugars are not absorbed well. These therefore also help to reduce a postprandial glucose spike and can do so by up to 50%. Side effects are related to the undigested carbs, which are quite predictable. Diarrhea, abdominal pain, and flatulence. An example of an alpha-glucosidase inhibitor is A-carbose. The final class of drugs we'll talk about today are the SGL2 inhibitors which are actually used in type 1 diabetes as well as in type 2 diabetes. So SGLT2 stands for Sodium Glucose Cotransporter 2, and this transporter is responsible for reabsorbing glucose in the proximal convoluted tubule. The idea is that this leads to an increase of glucose being lost in the urine when you inhibit this transporter. You can imagine that due to this, one of the side effects is osmotic diuresis, because there will be more glucose in the urine. However, you can also have an increased risk of UTI and vaginal candida. 